Um, I do want to talk a little bit about three of the projects that we have going on that are an exemplar of the philosophy behind EcoBuild Systems. <clears throat> but before I do that, I want to back up just a little bit, about 14 billion years, to where it all started, where everything came out of nothing. And I like to look at that as, as sort of a, an analogy of human consciousness. At some point, we emerged out of the, the soup, and we became somewhat consciously aware. And at the very beginning, just like the beginning of our universe, everything was really dense and confused and, and very fast moving and bouncing off of one another. And, and I like to imagine that, like I said, as, as human consciousness is very much in the same manner. Now, as time went on, fast forward a few billion years, things started to organize themselves out of, out of all this matter and antimatter that are banging together. Uh, galaxies formed, solar systems formed, and at some point, the Earth that we're standing on today became reality, much like ideas started to form in the consciousness of man. Now, at the time, the Earth was, I'm sure, a very raw place something that, um, that didn't make a lot of sense, and lots of things were changing and happening, pressures and heat and cold and all kinds of chemicals mixing with one another. The, um, and, and as a result of this, what, uh, what, we, had, what we had going on is uh, as life began to emerge. Now, in the beginning, it was single-celled organisms, and I'm sure all kinds of things that we, we have no concept of today. But as time evolved, things, things began to emerge from this, more complex ideas of life, much, again, as in the consciousness of man. More complex ideas began to form as we gained a better understanding of the things around us. Now, at some point, when humanity arose, we began to form communities, tribes. We began to form collectives of people who lived together, who worked together, within the confines of the resources that they had available lo locally to survive. And people were dependent upon one another. They were dependent upon the earth. They were dependent upon the things that, that were given to them by the earth. Now, in order for this to happen, lots of things have to happen. There have to be cycles. There has to be a way for things to perpetuate themselves. Otherwise, they, they get they get lost, they, they fall behind. We, we see evidence of that in fossil records. I look at the Earth as a great research and development laboratory that's been around for billions of years. <coughs> Things that work continue to evolve and get better over time. Things that don't work get left behind. And one of the things that I've observed, um, I'm, I'm a builder, I'm a Creator, I am a mad scientist a, a bit, if you will. I like to experiment with things and determine, take things apart and learn how they work. And one of the things of my observation of the Earth here is that things that work happen in cycles. In the forest, a tree dies. It falls over. Insects devour it. Uh, it becomes food for the insects. They break it down into materials that then become soil again so that new life can emerge from that. It's a complete cycle. Nothing gets wasted. Nothing gets thrown away. Now, at some point in the evolution of the consciousness of man, we got this idea that we knew enough to where we could conquer nature. We could do much better than nature. And from this, somehow this very linear, non-cyclical pattern of thought began to emerge. And by linear, I mean <clears throat> we take resources, we f form them and shape them into products and services and goods. We package them up. We put them in a store. We, as consumers, we go and buy those products. We consume them. We throw them away, and they get trucked off to a landfill somewhere. So we're taking resources and concentrating them, taking resources from a vast area and concentrating them into a small area, a very linear method of thinking. Now, that linear method has, has really advanced itself exponentially in, since the 1950s, I think. Um, the Industrial Age is, is what allowed this to happen, and that started maybe 170 years ago or so. But really, things rapidly advanced with the onset of World Wars I and II, when we started to mechanize things, and we started to create systems of, based on scales of economy, based on production. Now, 
what has resulted from that is, is this linear thought pattern that we see pervade in nearly every aspect of our life, from food to shelter to energy to finance. With food, we have developed mechanisms to create large quantities of food from the arable land that we have available on the planet. Now, an interesting fact that I've heard is that in 1948, 60% of the produce consumed in the United States was actually grown in victory gardens in people's front yard. Now over time, since that rapid suburban sprawl, that figure has come down to less than 1%. We get our food from industrialized farming. Now again, mechanization, petrochemicals, all kinds of things have come together, culminated to where we have this ability to produce mass quantities of food. And as a result of that, we've been able to feed lots of people. We've been able to provide for lots of people. Now, one of the things that, again, began to emerge in the 50s was the concept of the nuclear family, the husband, wife, two and a half kids, if you will. And <clears throat> with all of this rapid industrialization came the notion that we should be responsible for every aspect of our lives, that we should be responsible for our food, our shelter, our water, our clothing, and all of our needs were, are served within that nuclear family. Now again, following the linear pathway of our finances, where we basically take wealth from one large area and concentrate it into one small area, um, through inflation and deflation, we've come to a point in life now where basically that nuclear family requires two incomes to operate. The cost of energy is ex very expensive. The cost of shelter, the cost of water, the cost of housing, all of these things are very real costs that we have to deal with. It's a struggle. And in order to do so, we, it requires two incomes typically. So when you have those two and a half kids, you've got, you've got to do something with them while you're at work. So 40% of the income of at least one of the working people in a household typically goes towards childcare. Now, we rewind a bit to this, these, this concept of tribe and community. Um, there, was, there were people in, within a community that were necessary for that community to continue to thrive and evolve. Elders became responsible partly for child rearing so that the younger generations could work, could provide the food, could provide the shelter, could provide the necessities for life for the rest of the community. Each person might have developed a special skill and become a very integral part of that community, something that was very, very necessary for its, for its inherent survival. Now we've removed a lot of that through our, through our technology, through our mechanization, through our industrialization. But what we've also removed, and what a couple of people have talked about here, is that human connection, that interdependence upon one another. And we're also beginning to experience the, the flip side of that very linear pathway. We've extracted a lot of resources over the last 150 years. And we've, we've taken them from a wide area and we've concentrated those resources into a very small area to the point where we're starting to experience the downside of that. Uh, we look around today at the world, we see that um, our financial situation is certainly not the best. We hear news about that every day. Housing is in decline. Everything is in decline. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. People are starting to realize that this isn't working anymore. And people are searching. People are searching for something different. Now, just as the universe continues to expand, so I believe does the human consciousness. I believe that within us all is the ability to see beyond this very linear thought pattern. Now, as a builder, I, I look at the built environment, of course, and I look at those linear pathways that we build in. We extract resources, we manufacture them into products, we build homes that require large amounts of energy to make comfortable, and we consume. Actually, one of the things that, that to me is quite an interesting factoid is the fact that here in the United States, we're no longer referred to as citizens of the United States by our government, but we are consumers. And the health of our economy is based on a consumer price index. Now, that completely, in my opinion, excludes the human element of who we really are. Are we really consumers? Yes, we consume things, but we also have the capability to give things back. 
And as a builder, I like to look at projects from a standpoint of how can we develop a project that doesn't just consume, but also returns at the same time. Now, I'm also a permaculture designer. And as part of permaculture, that concept is that if you have a waste product or something that you're getting rid of, then what you really have is a resource that you haven't figured out how to utilize yet. That there's the concept of waste is, is very is something that we need to make passe. Right now, it's it's something that's a very real part of what we do, and, and basically our health of our economy depends upon the constant creation of waste because that means that we're consuming. Now, when we build when we build a build environment. <coughs> We have things we have to take care of. We have to take care of water. We have to take care of the shelter aspect of it. We have to take care of human comfort. We have to take care of food. Where is it going to come from? How are we going to prepare it? How are we going to dispose of it? We have waste ourselves, uh, human waste that we create that we have to deal with. Now again, it's the concept of waste is something that we've created. I like to look at all of these things as a potential resource. As we design these projects, uh, I mentioned earlier the Roosevelt Building, the Earthship Florida project. Um, we're also doing, uh, creating some communities as well, co-housing developments and, and uh, communities that are they're based upon a cluster model to take advantage of economies of scale. What these things have in common is that we are looking at those precepts of waste and determining how we can best utilize that resource that, that, ha, that lays, has lain there fallow for so long. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the concept of water. Here in Florida, people think we don't have any problems with water. We're a peninsular state. We're surrounded by it on three sides. There's streams, lakes, rivers, everything you can imagine running everywhere through here, all kinds of wetlands. The truth of the matter is we're part of a watershed that encompasses most of the southeast. And we actually have political wars over water rights here in the state of Florida with a couple of our adjacent states. Water management is a problem. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I see is we flush our toilets with drinking water. Now, that doesn't really, to me, make a heck of a lot of sense because it's very expensive to take raw, raw water and turn it into potable water. It's also a very energy intensive and a very, very resource intensive process. So I think that that's one of the things that we need to rethink. The way we manage energy. Here in Florida, about 75% of the energy that we consume in a typical household is utilized by heating and air conditioning and hot water heating. So we have an air conditioning unit over here. We have a hot water heater over here. And we put energy into it so that when we turn on the shower, it's nice and warm. And when we get out of the shower, it's nice and cool. Um, one of the things about my exploration into how things work is I'm, I'm very interested in thermodynamics. I'm very interested in how heat and cold relate to one another. And actually cold, the concept of cold is actually the absence of heat. So we're basically taking heat from a building and exhausting it into the air. That's the typical model for air conditioning. Well, if we're taking heat out here and we're exhausting it out here and then we're putting heat into this, this big container of water right here, why can't we take this heat that we're pulling out of the building and just put it in the water? One input instead of two. Um, and then taking that a little bit further, uh, the concept that, that he mentioned earlier, the eco-build systems, which is the method that we're building a lot of, lot of new buildings with now, we're using properties of the building uh, itself, the building materials themselves. What are the properties of that? We use metal, we use concrete, we use stone. We use insulation, we use all kinds of things. And each one of these things has a different thermal property. Water, um, concrete, stone, things like that are a dense thermal mass. They store energy like a battery stores electricity. And if we build our homes in a method where we put that kind of thermal mass in connection with the air inside the home, then it takes a lot less energy to maintain a current constant temperature because you reach a thermal flywheel effect. Now. <laughs> Taking that a little bit further, when we cluster these buildings together, we can take advantage of the economies of scale. All of these things like wastewater management, water management, energy management, all work better when, they're, when homes are clustered together in a community. Now from a building standpoint, that helps me to build efficient homes, efficient buildings, much more cost effectively. 
But from the human standpoint of it, we want to create communities where people get together and cooperate. They figure out how to live together. Um, one of the homes, that, one of the communities we're working on uh, zoning and design for right now in Carrollwood, here in Tampa Bay area, we're going to have a community center that is actually literally and figuratively going to be the heart of the community. It'll house a chiller system that will provide both cooling and hot water heating for all of the buildings in the community. It'll also have a big common area where people can get together, cook meals, share and fellowship, and there will be many multi-purpose rooms in there so that people can play guitar or do their art or whatever it is that their passion is, and they can share that with the people in the community. This community is going to be designed where car, car traffic is, is sort of secondary to it. Right now, we design communities around the streets. Uh, this is going to have a large green area, uh, a large common area where the homes are going to be designed to bring people together and to cause people to want to interact with one another on a regular basis. So it's, it's a rethinking of, of the entire system and our wastewater treatment is handled with plants that provide food and provide energy and we use natural systems to close those loops up, to, to get rid of that linear pathway. All of the quote unquote waste remains on site and gets recycled into a new resource. Now beyond this, we have to look at that financial picture. And one of the things that we're working on now is creating a circular model of finance so that wealth stays in the community. A lot of people are upside down right now on their land, and we're looking at ways that we can reverse that to keep that wealth in the community rather than the traditional model of finance of moving things from one place to another, taking wealth out of communities and concentrating it in very small areas again. So that is my concept of closing the loop on community. Now you can find out a little bit more about what we're doing by visiting the Roosevelt 2.0 in Ybor City, the Earthship Florida down in, in Manatee County. These are two very different examples of what, what this looks like. Manatee County is a rural area. We have several different businesses that will be operating out of that. They're all self-sustaining businesses. Same thing with the Roosevelt. We have an artist collective there and we have commerce there and we have a number of different things where we will be doing dense urban food production there to show people that we don't have to have produce that travels from 2,500 miles. <laughs> so my concept and my gift to the earth today for Earth Day is that we create communities that work. Mm -hmm.